So welcome. This is a Coast Clinic on 3D printing. Um, call it the good, the bad, and the smelly. I think it's really a, an interesting thing because there's a lot of good things about 3D printing, but as you're going to find out, if you do resin, you've got to deal with the smells and other things. Uh, Jonathan Shower is going to do a, uh, a quick run across uh, what 3D printing is, what the options are, and that's going to really help us understand you know, the choices that happen here. Uh, what's really exciting about 3D printing is whether you choose filament printing on the left or resin printing on the right, two different technologies, the prices are coming under $200. Uh, so if you look at an investment for a model railroading tool versus laser cutting or a cry cut, it's a very cost effective solution. And the question is, does it have the right kind of power for you? Uh, and there's a whole series of questions here about what kind of technologies are there? What about the CAD applications? Should you use a service? Um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then a little bit about uh, 3D printing, you know, for modeling, you know, what can you model? And I think a big question, how does scale affect your 3D modeling use? Um, we're talking a lot probably about the difference between res resolution and ease of use. So anyway, with that, I'm gonna throw it over to Jonathan and uh, have him start sharing. And he's gonna do a, an intro to um, 3D printing overall and kind of let us understand what the options are and um, what the choices are. So Jonathan, I'll throw it to you. Sounds great. Can you hear me? Uh, might help if I come off mute. You are, you're fine. I you're am off mute. mute. Okay, there you go. Can you see my desktop? Yes. Okay, perfect. So, so hello everyone, or good morning. So, um, I'm new to to participating in this. I'm a uh, worked for Hewlett Packard for uh, 32 years. I took an early retirement package, and I'm getting back into one of my loves, and that's model railroading. Um, I've been dabbling with 3D printing for a long time. Um, many years actually and what I'm going to do is just kind of do a walkthrough of what is it kind of level set with that give some examples and kind of walk through this I like interaction interactive sessions so I've got my chat window open on the side P please feel free if you have a question throw it in the chat window I'll try to answer that I'll keep an eye on that as I go through um, so um, already went through the agenda. It's, it's really what is it? What can you print? How do you get started? I'll walk through what my step is, kind of my typical workflow, flow, and then you know, what have I learned so far? What are some of those interesting things? Of time permitting, I can go through like a day in the life of actually how I did a particular piece. So what is 3D printing? Everyone here is probably familiar with CNC or machining where you take a, a physical item and then you remove material. 3D printing is kind of the opposite of that. It's an additive manufacturing. And there's a lot of different technologies and it's growing really fast. Um, I actually have a, a dear friend of mine who works at Hewlett Packard Inc. who makes uh, that machine down in the right here, um, which is a high end, it can print metal and all types of really cool stuff. Um, so, but from a hobbyist perspective, oops, somebody's got Okay, uh, so from a hobbyist perspective, there's resins, um, and that's a liquid-based type of printing technology. Um, then there's PAs and ABS, and, and PET, uh, PET is like what you make soda bottles out of, or fused materials that a printer like uh, this one here um, actually deposits material. Um, there's a growing number of what I call advanced materials. There's flexible materials. Um, so I have actually print my own gaskets and stuff. Um, it's a softer material. Um, I also dabbled with printing uh, metal and wood infused. So you can get fibers or technology that has metal particles or carbon fiber or wood in it. And then you can do a lot more post-processing. Um, there's a new emerging casting material, so if you print something, and this is on the resin side, you could print something that is, uh, think of your lost uh, wax you know, um, molds. Um, so you can create a mold and it's like a wax material. So that's a new technology um, that's just emerging right now and it's at a hobbyist price point. Um, so the big question, 
what can you do with a 3D printer? Um, obviously, you, you know, anything you can think of, given time and energy and, and of course, money, um, you can print it. Uh, there's detailed parts, brackets, clips, enclosures, tool organizer, uh, organizers, sound baffles, and I'm going to do a quick flyby with some of the photos. Um, so on my workbench, this is all 3D a tool holder a, uh, for, you know, paint and stuff like that. Um, I, 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 pliers holder, all my paint rack in the back. Um, this one I actually printed just last week. I was building a model and I kid you not, I spilled over this three times, um, made a big mess and I said enough is enough. So I actually 3D printed a little base um, and I have built it since. Um, I built myself a and 3D printed a um, soldering filter. It's a carbon filter. So when I'm soldering with the, you know, um, the resins, it just gets the fumes out and then I, and, on an iPad. This is all off of your FDM types printers. That's where you have the spool of material um, and it deposits it. Um, I've also done things, oops, get out of this, next slide. Um, models. Um, and so I, one of my other hobbies is building actual little models and stuff. And so everything you see on this, um, the stand here, all the detailed parts here, these lights, they're all 3D printed. This is a 3D printed piece right here. Um, I just recently finished building a uh, Star Trek uh, model that I put LED lights in. I 3D printed pieces inside it and as well as a stand. And then this Saturn V engine, the F1 engine, that's all 3D printed as well as this piece here. Um, now, these models here, unlike the tool holders, these are all resin printed because you can get a much higher density with that. So getting into, you know, more of the resin printing, uh, gaming miniatures. So my son plays a lot of miniature games, and this is kind of how I ended up getting into 3D printing, is he wanted pieces printed. Um, and so this figure and a lot of the pieces on this table, they are all 3D printed. Um, and then uh, from my layout perspective, I'm a, a fanatic of, of printing my own brackets and stuff. So, uh, you know, a uh, holder for my meter for my uh, uh, power management on my uh, layout, um, a sprog holder. My, my recent thing that I did was a, a tester for DCC and made my little old rolly things. And then, of course, holders for, you know, throttles and stuff. Um, my speaker baffle. This was one of the more fun projects. Um, and so uh, PBL, Jimmy, uh, encouraged me to put sound in this little brass locomotive. Um, and I, I got myself my nice little speaker. I put it in. It sounded okay. But how do you get something in such a small spot? So I, I just sketched out a little baffle, put the speaker in it, and the sound changed tremendously. And this is a custom baffle that fits the curvature of this roof. So it fits in really nice and tight and it sounds great. So that's a great little example. Where I think the resin printing really comes in and what we need to think about, and you know, this is the newest addition to my, my workshop, is the ability to print these small parts. Um, and so this is an inch by, you know, a half inch by an inch tall. Um, this is even smaller. These are just really highly detailed. You can't even see the printing lines on them. Um, and it was uh, one of these inspirations. I did this model. Um, most of the pieces in here are 3D printed. And I wanted a printing press in the back room. Um, and I got inspired by you know chat groups. And, and somebody pointed me in the right direction of what to look for. And I found this piece and printed it. And now this model is actually complete. So, how do you get started? Well, there's two ways. Um, you can do a service, Shapeways, um, Ultimate 3D Printing, uh, Craft Cloud, those are services. It can get expensive quickly. Um, so, for the models that I was showing, my rocket models, some of those I actually paid for uh, Shapeways, and they were like 100 bucks for the model. Um, and, you know, compared to kit models these days, that's not that much. But if you're going to be doing a lot of that, that can add up pretty quick. Um, on the other side, well, you can get your own setup, get your printer and the post-processing gear. Um, so let me talk through my setup. Um, I'm a Mac user, so I, I've got a Mac. Um, 
folks who use PCs might have a little easier time from finding pieces of software, um, but you can do it equally as well with a Mac. Um, I started with a Mono Price 3, my first, that's your, your sub you know, $200 printer, 3D resin, or not resin, um, filament printer. Um, I printed with that for about a year and a half, and then I upgraded to um, the uh, Pierre USA SLA printer. That one um, is around a $700 printer. Huge quality difference between these two. Um, so the, the $200 printers work great. You do have to pay attention more to the environment when you print. Um, and then my latest edition was uh, an Anycubic uh, Proton Printer. Um, I got that on sale last year. I think it was like 270 for that piece, so a little more than than just your your $200 or less. Uh, but it's a fantastic printer. Um, I built my own UV cure box, so when you get into resin printing, you've got to cure it. So unlike the filament printers, it heats the material deposits it, and then there's a fan that cools it, and it just kind of 3D prints out your thing. And then when it's done printing, it's done printing. Um, you take it and use it however you want, do some post-processing. For resin printing, it actually is a liquid, and it uses ultraviolet light that cures a very thin layer and then moves to the next layer. But it doesn't fully set it. You have to clean it and cure it. So, I, you know, you can buy a UV clearing box. I built one. Um, you need to clean it. You already mentioned, resin is stinky. Um, it's also sticky. It's also not very good for you to breathe. Um, so you want to ventilate it. So I've got ventilation. Um, both of the printers have enclosures. My investment, um, because I bought, a, you know, the $700 printer, I probably spent you know, 850 um, for my XLA printer. The resin printing, all said and done, I kind of did a quick adding up when you get the UV and cleaning set up and some ventilation and all that. It comes in at around $500 is at least what I've spent. Um, software, let's talk a little bit about that. So I've gotten really into building some of my own stuff. So Tinkercad um, and everything I use from a software perspective, I haven't spent anything it's all free um, so Tinkercad you can do a lot very easy to use um, there is uh, Fusion 360 um, that is a full-fledged system you can get as a, a hobbyist you can get a license for free it's a little limited in what it can do uh, versus the full-end one um, but for our needs you can do anything you want with it um, thus the um, printers come with their own software, so I use um, the slicing software for uh, the filament base that came with the printer. For the Anycubic, um, I use uh, Chittabox. It actually does a much better job at slicing. What slicing is, is when you take a three-dimensional object and you want to do the additive manufacturing, the printers are, you know, like your dot matrix printer, they print one row at a time. Each of those is a slice, and of course, then it builds it up over you know the three dimensions. Um, so they call those slicers. There's also an open source piece. It's called the Photon File Viewer. Um, and for 3D printing on resins, you really want to check how it's printing. Now I'll get into why in a, in a little bit. Um, and then you've got your consumables. You know, a PLA spool. I my favorite to print in is PLA Plus. Um, it's very easy to work with. A spool runs you from $19 to $28. Um, and then resin, a, a 500 milliliter bottle of resin, anywhere from 19 to 22 bucks for the resins. Um, that you're traditional. Now, if you get into some of the exotics, prices can um, go quite a bit. So you're probably asking, okay, what does it really cost to print a part? Um, so once again, these two pieces here, which was for my printing press, um, they cost me about 11 cents of material. Um, so pretty inexpensive uh, for a given part. That slide that I had all that stuff on my workbench, you know, so the tools, holders, the paint holders, my tool stand, the little fan, I probably spent $2 on the, the uh, filament. So the actual parts for printing, not that expensive. Um, so it's really getting the hardware set up and getting the process set up.
So if we look at my room, so what I have set up, and I'll go into these a little bit, but I have my filament printer and then my resin printer with the, the venting. This is the picture of my, my sub uh, $200 printer that I started with. Uh, very, very easy to use. Um, it works really well. Um, I also will say I've had customer support on all three of these printers. Um, this one, they actually, I was having problems with the heating bed. Um, they just sent me a whole new printer. Um, with my resin printer, I would take oh, Did I lose you for a second? Am I back? Yeah, we had a moment of, of audio dropout. Yeah, you're back. Okay. Um, for my resin printing, I had uh, some problems with the actual LCD uh, display, um, and I interacted with them. Uh, AnyCubic, there it's overseas, um, so there was a, a slight delay, but no questions asked. They just sent me all the replacement parts, um, and it was really easy to swap out, and I was back in business. And then a similar thing with my heating element on this one. So um, I, I will say. E if you go down this path, look at who you're buying, what vendor. Um, some of them are really good at um, you know, taking care of you after the sale, um, and I'd happily recommend these three. And so if I look at my SLA printing or my added of the filament, you really want to have it in an enclosure. It doesn't necessarily smell, um, but there are micro particles that come off when you do print. Um, the other thing is you want to also control the environment. Um, and then I've, I, it's, I've, you know, 3D printed my own little spool holders and all that. But this is just, I picked up the, the IKEA tables for $9 um, or something like that. And I just, you know, got some plexiglass and built up some sides around it. And I had a box. Um, so it doesn't need to be much, uh, but you really want one. Um, and then for my resin printer, this one's a little more elaborate. I, I have a base that has a vent on it, so the fumes kind of go down through it. So this printer comes in an enclosed case, uh, but you really want to vent it. Um, and then I have my, my UV cure box. I'll go into that in a little bit more, and then my cleaning station. Um, and I did it again. Let me go. So we'll start with the vent you really want to vent it outside. It is um, actually pretty uh, toxic, the fumes. Um, and somehow I zoomed in. How do I zoom out? There we go. Sorry about that. Um, so so I, I have a vent in the back. Um, and this is the 3D printed part. I got that offline, um, and I'll show you where you can find some of these things. Um, and then I have a little fan, that I, it just one of the computer fans that I pulled out of something, um, and then a vent to go out the window. Absolutely want to do that, um, It's because it's, it's stinky. Um, I have one of those magnetic uh, lab spinners. I bought that from you know, Amazon for like 15 bucks. Um, you want to wash your stuff in alcohol, 99% um, if you can get it. Oh, it was really easy to get pre-pandemic. Not as easy now, but the, you want like pure alcohol. And then a UV box. So I just bought, once again from Amazon, a UV light. And there's actually labeled very well. You know, this is good for resin curing and all that. And I just built myself a little wood box. I got some mirror material put on the inside. And then I got the, the there's these cool little, um, for displaying, you know, rocks and jewelry or things like that. And they've got little solar panels on it, so they spin when there's light. So you don't have to put batteries in it. And UV light is perfect for that. So I just have one of those inside the box. I put my part in there. 20 minutes later, it's cured. Um, so everything I, you can find it all, you know, on, on Amazon's one of my favorite shopping places for better or for worse, but here's your little U, 3D printer UV light. And so, um, that was 15 bucks. Here's your little spinners. Um, I think I got those two as a two pack for four bucks. There's different versions now available. Um, little, here's the magnetic spinner, um, the little case, you just get all those nice parts. Um, 
I didn't come up with all these ideas. There is tremendous amount of information out there. Um, Thingverse is like my favorite place. So this guy here on the left, he, that's what got me into um, a good way of venting. I didn't use his vent, but his cleaning stuff in his, his curing boxes, what he, you know, I, I liked what he did, so I, I 3D printed his stuff. And then from the enclosure, once again, all the parts I printed with my printer, and I got the idea from, you know, somebody else so you know credit where credits do they're not my own designs but I did modify all the designs okay so so workflow for doing a an FDM this is your your filament based um, find the part design it um, and you, you just I like to do prints along the way to test if I'm doing my own designs um, you slice it you got to make sure you got it in the right orientation add supports if needed, um, figure out the resolution you want, um, the color and the material you want to use. Um, so each material has different properties. So if you use things like ABS, it's harder to, to uh, print with, uh, but it's stronger. Um, PLA, and also it's, it's maybe not as environmentally uh, friendly. PLA, which is one of my favorites, that is a plant-based material not as structurally strong, but it's very easy to print with lower temperatures, um, but it doesn't hold up as well to UV lights. Um, there is a, a question, sorry, I, I forgot to keep an eye on that. Yes, uh, you really need to uh, vent outside. Um, I'm assuming that's what the, if the question is. Um, it, it's, you can run it through carbon filters and all that. It's just far better to vent it outside. Um, and yes, there are places that have 3D printers available. Um, and or friends, I, it's I actually print things for for friends of mine as well. As, you know, if you, if you have access to the, you know, for 3D printer, it doesn't have to be yourself to to make all the investments. Um, resolution. So the state of the art for home printing of the, the fusion or the deposited, the, the filament based, is about 0.2 millimeters. That's probably the best you can get. Um, I, it's, it's, and it does leave lines. And I'll show some examples of, of different parts soon. Um, the workflow for a resin, did I finish? Yeah. Um, oh, you print. It takes a while to print. So a piece that, um, um, okay, like uh, the the little brackets I, I printed for my my um, NCE throttles. That probably took an hour to print. Um, so you start the print and you wait. Um, I have done prints that have taken close to 14 hours to print big things. Um, the resin printers are a little bit quicker because they're much smaller in parts, or you know that you print. But by the way, Jonathan, just important to say there's there's a fairly big variability in FDM depending upon the quality you choose, the kind of thickness of the lines of each layer yes. can be yes. varied. And you can if you go with fine layers, you can double the print time versus thicker layers, which is faster. So you can kind of deter a little bit with FDM of print time based on quality. Yes. Yeah, very good point. Thank you. Yeah. The the setting the print layer and it's also true for resin printing um, the resolution you select will dramatically Im impact print time uh, but that also impacts the quality level the, you know the detail and how smooth the surface is and it also has structural implications and so even with the FDM printing if you go through and do you know a 0.4 millimeter print so rather fast the same part printed at you know 0.2 millimeters, it, the the 0.2 is going to be a lot stronger because um, you you fused more layers together. So uh, it's things to keep in mind. And of course, once you've finished um, trimming in and filing it, uh, glue if you want. A company that makes an epoxy seal um, that you can paint over your FDMs or your filament-based printers to get a nice, super smooth, um, you know, finish on it. Uh, and of course, um, you know, if you have multiple parts, you glue them together. 
Five minute epoxy is probably one of the best. I've started playing around with UV epoxy and I'm really impressed with what you can do with that. And then prime and paint as needed, depending upon what you're doing. Most of my you know, FDM or filament based printing, I don't paint. I just pick a color and, and I print and go from there um, because I'm doing more structural things with it. I don't do detailed parts with it because the resolution's not there. Now, if I look at resin printing, the flow is pretty much the same in the beginning, and that's find your part, design it, build, design your own, test as you you know do pieces of it. Um, you go through a similar slicing, print orientation. How does it line up on the printer? Supports. That is re it, this is where it gets really important to have supports when you do printing. Um, I'm going to actually show this piece here. Um, that's that little printing press I did. Now, the thing with additive, and you actually ended up doing it this way, upside down. So we printed this layer first and kept going through. When you get to like this piece here, all of a sudden you have a piece that's hanging out in midair and you need a way to attach it. So supports, you have to come in and, and make sure that, you know, these pieces that are out suspended in there have supports. And I'll, I'll show what that looks like. Um, but that's probably the trickiest part in resin printing is once you get into resin printing, I want to do more detailed parts. And I want to have those fine details. All of a sudden, you need to start thinking about supports. How do I print it such there's supports? Now, the good news is the software does a lot of that for you. OK, so you get the supports figure out the resolution. Now we're talking in resolutions that you can go find enough you can't even see the print lines. Um, once again, time becomes a factor. Um, and then the material, not as many varieties in resin printing. So there's your standard resins. There's now the casting resins and a few, a few others. This is one area that's evolving um, a little bit slower with materials, I would say. And print times, um, it can be from minutes to hours to, you know, eight hours, half a day um, for even a resin print. Post-processing, and I highlighted this in red, this is where the two technologies go very different directions. Um, you got to wash it in alcohol, 99%. Then you remove the supporting material. You want to wash it again and then you want to use UV seal it, um, and then maybe sand it. Uh, and that's where, where the, the support pieces were for the supporting material. Um, and then you really want to wash it again. And I like Comet, um, good old-fashioned Comet. It's a little abrasive, but that really helps get it nice and clean. Um, and then you, you prime it and paint it as, as desired. Um, so that's one of the very interesting in divergence between resin printing and the filament-based printing. OK, uh, next slide. So what have I learned? I've already stated this. PLA Plus is like the easiest stuff to work with. I, I absolutely love it. Um, Air temperature is absolutely key. Um, so when I'm doing my, re uh, my, my filament base printing for PLA, you really want the air temperature around it to be between 100 and 110 degrees. Um, I was struggling with getting things to stick to the plate, not have warping layer separation and all that. And I was doing all my prints in that little box I built, and the temperature was about 90 degrees. Um, I bumped it up 10 degrees, and my, all my printing problems went away. All of a sudden, I was having almost every print was working perfect the first time. And so that air temperature around the filament as it's printing makes a huge difference. Same is true for resins. Uh, not quite as warm, but you know, when you get the air temperature around the resin at around 90 degrees, it stays nice and fluid and it may just you get less air bubbles in the pieces it just works a whole lot better and so I actually put a little or built a little heater that's inside my my resin printer and I you know have a cheap little you know thermostat that turns it on and off and I keep it around 90 degrees and my printing got a whole lot better um, other thing I've learned resin is very finicky to print with um, I can whip up a part and print it with filament 
you know, uh, start to finish for, you know, a moderate piece, hour, two hours tops. Um, resin, I usually end up having to try and print it three, four times to get it to, to stick appropriately, the right supports. It's just, it's, it's finicky. Um, a, a larger learning curve. Um, my newest learning is uh, resin, unlike the filaments, it does expire, and the older it gets, it becomes more problematic. I was getting to uh, very frustrated with my resin printing, um, and then I ran out and I bought another bottle of, of resin, tried to print, worked perfect the first time. And what I've discovered in reading some of the chat groups is as the resin gets old, um, it starts breaking down a little bit. And then ventilation, it's really important to have. I can't stress that enough. Um, when I do resin printing, even though I'm venting outside, my hobby room stinks. Um, and if I don't close the door, I hear from my family. Um, and it's not really the best for you. Ultimately, I want to move my resin printing out of my hobby room because you know, I want to be able to print. <laughs> um, and I, you know, when I print, and generally I start to print, I leave room. Um, the other thing, print samples. Um, uh, the other interesting thing I've learned, yeah, but you know, never give up. Um, if it doesn't print right, it's usually the environment you're printing in. It's not enough supports. It's something just, you know, I, but don't give up. Keep going. Um, and then <laughs> my other one is, is on the filament based. Uh, be careful when you change the spools. A couple of times I've had my line get tucked, and that can really end up in a spidery mess. Um, the other thing in both printers, resin or filament based, uh, you want to keep an eye on it for that first five, ten minutes of a print. Most of my failures happen in that first five to ten minutes. I've had failures further down the road, uh, but it, it's, if it's going to fail, you're going to have a problem, it doesn't stick to the plate, it's going to happen right in the beginning. And then if you go down the resin path, uh, it's going to get messy. Uh, make sure you have good, you know, gloves and an area that if you spill some resin, it's no big deal. Um, and I've also found the Internet is wonderful. There are a couple of great websites that I hit this printing problem, you know, pick, you know, resin printing or, or filament based or whatever. And there's a whole list, well, these are the common things that cause that problem. And every time I've run into a printing problem, I, I look at my one of my two favorite websites, see what the problem is, I make an adjustment as they, they recommend or that others have recommended, and nine times out of ten, the problem has gone away. So, you know, there is a lot of good information out there. How to find or create things. Um, how long is oh? How long does resin go before it goes bad? Well, the good news is the bottles have um, dates on them, uh, expiration dates. I discovered, and they last a, at least the, one, the the latest one I got. Its expiration date is a year out, so you know, it's about a year. Um, I unless you do a real lot of printing, I would say a 500 milliliter bottle will last you. Well, you know, you'll probably get through it in about a year, at least, at least for me so far. Um, how do you find or create items? So Thingverse is one of my favorite places. Um, uh, and, and these slides, we'll, we'll get these out. You can get the links. Uh, my Mini Factory, find a lot of stuff. CG Trader and Epic Finder, they, those are all, they have things that um, you can buy um, and free stuff. Um, what conditions uh, do I store the resin at for the best life? I keep them in a uh, basically a dark closet, and in, they're in the coolest room in my house. Um, so yeah, I would say I try to keep the temperature no higher than than uh, seventy degrees. Um, and you really want um, resin cures because of light, ultraviolet, um, and so any light they come in dark bottles, but any light um, that gets to it is bad. Um, I actually saw an interesting comment, Jonathan, on the internet where they said if you have old resin and you want to get rid of it, just leave it outdoors in the sunshine and it'll cure up hard after about a day. Yes, so, absolutely. So yes. yeah, that's any light. Any light will kill it over time. Yes, light absolutely. Um, and and what when I first 
the first couple of parts I printed, I had when I got the resin printed, you know, my son and I were excited to print. Um, I didn't have a UV curing thing. The way you cure it is you take your part and you put it out in the sunlight. Leave it out there for an hour, come back, and your part is cured. <laughs> you know, so so you don't have to have a cure box. Um, you just need a sunny day. Um, and so, uh, so you want to keep your resin cool and dark. Um, those are all great places to find parts. Of course, you know, Google, I want to find, you know, whatever. Um, I and just put the word STL after it. STL is, is the common uh, 3D uh, modeling file. Um, and y you can spend hours looking for that part. Um, and then I, when you can't find it, you go ahead and create it. Um, I, I don't know if Tinkercad is moving to a pay model. Um, even if they did, there are a lot of free options out there. Um, and so, um, but I like Tinkercad because it's so easy to use. Um, in a, in a, I can do a quick showing on that one. Um, Fusion 360 has a learning curve, a lot of great YouTube videos on how to do different pieces, but it's a full-fledged. Um, and so if you're you're trying to do something where, you know, you got to get measurements right and things like that, Fusion 360 would be my recommendation. I'm actually learning SketchUp right now. I'm, I'm kind of working on a part or modifying a part, and the individual sent you SketchUp, and so he just sent me the SketchUp file, and so I've now jumped in and I'm starting to use uh, SketchUp and learn that one. Um, it's it's more powerful than Tinkercad, not as powerful as Fusion 360. Once again, you can get that one free too. Um, and then here's all the links to all the different pieces. Um, let me just show the the Tinkercad one. So. If you go back to you know my printing press, one of the things is I needed a storage box, um, and so it is as simple as all the shape is, and it, it literally took me probably five minutes to to make this piece. Um, all it really is is a bunch of blocks, you know, and so it, you build a shape. And then here's another shape, and here this is a removed shape and a triangle. So it, it's just a collection of shapes that I quickly threw together. I, is this exactly prototypical scale? For what I was trying to do, I was going for the impression. So I just threw a bunch of shapes together, and then I resin printed it. So I spent five minutes on this piece and printed it, and you know, an hour later, I had what I needed. <laughs> and so you, you don't have to you know, go crazy as they can't find things. Um, let me go through a design walkthrough. Do we have time for that? I wasn't sure how much time I had. Sure, I think we're good, actually. We're good. OK. OK, so let me walk through my whole process of this particular building, which I showed off a couple weeks ago or maybe a month ago, um, which got me <laughs> roped into this. Um, how did this come about? Um, so I built this map. You've seen this picture before. I had a blank room in the back. I needed my printing press. So I went and did my search. I said, okay, let's search for a printing press. Um, and I searched for, you know, printing press STL. And just in Google, I all types of cool stuff. Um, spent probably about 30 minutes looking around for different ones. And I found these two that kind of caught my eye. Um, and you'll recognize the one on the right, because that's the one I ended up doing. Um, this one was kind of cool. This is somebody did this model, and this is an actual one that kind of works. Um, but I, I like the format. But then I stumbled across this one, and I thought, wow, that's exactly what I'm looking for. Uh, and this is the model. Um, just a beautiful piece of work that, that, that this person created. Um, so from that, uh, Side down here. So there it is, found it, wonderful, beautiful piece. Now I need that cabinet. And I searched and couldn't find it. So I built it. And I showed you that piece already. It's just a simple piece that's just a collection of squares, rectangles, and you it's very easy to use, make little groups. So I, I built up this piece and this piece as groups, and I just copied it, spaced them all out, you know, 
a couple millimeters apart from each other, put a triangle, put three boxes on it, and voila, I had the piece. Now, scaling it. So you drop these shapes into your, your favorite slicer, um, and you go through, and this particular one was way too big, the printing press. Um, but that was okay. I just set scale it down, so I put the two pieces on in a nice scale. Now, supports. I, for the for this piece here, I, as I mentioned earlier, you've, when you have overhangs like this, you have to support it in printing. Um, the printers, you, you, if you print something in the middle of nowhere, it's just it's going to make a mess out of stuff. So I told the software, um, there's a simple little button that says add supports, and I said add supports, and it goes through and it calculates and looks at where are all the overhangs that it needs support and it adds them. Um, what I typically do is I add the supports, I print it, see how it comes out, and then maybe I'll go in and modify some of the supports because um, you know software is not perfect. Um, this particular model, it supported perfectly. First try, it took me one try to print this. Um, so once you get the supports, you want to go through, slice it, and then verify. And in this little picture here, so the, the software has this uh, tool that you can go through, and it shows you layer by layer. You can run it through and play and watch where all the dots are because you don't want to have a, while it's printing, and basically the way this printer works is you have a vat of liquid, and it turns on a UV light in the dark area the UV light won't get through. The white areas, the UV light will get through and adhere and create an adhesion to the previous layer. So if you end up having a white layer that just appears out of nowhere, it's now going to create a solid piece of material in your vat of resin that's going to float around and stick to something and it, it can get messy. That's where the other piece of software, the Photon File Checker, comes in. So I, you can manually go through and scan this. There's a little piece of software. Somebody wrote a piece of code that just scans the output file and looks for a random, here's a piece, and there was nothing connecting to it. And it just flags them so you can go in and fix those. And so um, once you do that, you go into the printer and start the printing. Um, as you can tell, it took two hours and 49 minutes for that um, printing press and the bookcase to print. Now, let me talk about the times a little bit. Um, there's obviously the resolution adds to it, but one big difference between filament-based and resin-based printing. Filament, the bigger the part is or the number of pieces you put on the printer plate, because um, you can print multiple parts at the same time, every part, every piece on a, a you know, filament-based printer increases the time. With resin printing, it does not. It's really the height of the, the unit. So if I'm printing one piece or 10 pieces, if they're identical in size, the printing one versus 10 is the same amount of time. Um, so that's another little interesting, you know, thing about resin printing. Once you get your piece out of the resin, you wash it with alcohol, then it, it, all those supports. So my my bookcase thing for the 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 printing you know press pieces, there were no supports needed for that. But this, there was a lot of them. So you want to come through and just break off all of those supports and cut them. Um, and I you know I, various tools I use for that. Typically, you know, the, the side cutters as well as an X-Acto knife. And you just break off all the pieces. You want to do that before you cure it. Once you cure it, it becomes brittle and, and very, you know, easy to crack and break. When it comes off the printer, the, the UV light, because it's only exposing it each layer for a couple of seconds, maybe about 10, 15 seconds, um, it's hard, but it's still very pliable, and you can actually bend it. So, and it's much easier to cleanly clean up the unit. Once it's all done, I washed it, and then I hardened. Now these two pieces are they're ready for painting, um, and they're they're you know brittle, hard, 
you know, because I've been fully cured. And it takes about, I, I like to cure mine for about 20 minutes in my little ultraviolet cure. And then I prime them. And then I painted them, and there are the two finished pieces. Um, I, which, you know, you can't find this, you know, uh, to buy, per se. <laughs> um, and now they're in my, my nice building. Um, so what I'm actually going to do, um, I want to show some parts on the camera. So let's see if I stop share. And does my video become full? Yep. Okay. So let's see if I can actually, I'm going to move the camera. And so, so this was a sample part. Um, and so you can get some very interesting shapes with the resin printing. You could, you, you can't machine a piece like this. Um, here's my, my, my little linotype or the, the printing press. My camera's not really focusing in that well. Um, Detailed figures, you know, so my, my son's into to gaming miniatures, um, so there's a nice little miniature, but okay. you've... I'm getting lost in dress. <laughs> and then here, here, here's a 3D printed um, horse. Yeah, that, that this is actually, um, I think it's Alpine Models. They, they are now selling 3D printed pieces. Um, I... I'm in the process of building a, uh, a stamp mill. I couldn't find um, Grantline windows um, of the size I wanted. So I went into Tinkercad, and I designed up my little window, windows, um, and I printed all of those. And it probably took me about 20 minutes to print all those windows. Um, and, you know, here's a bookcase that I printed. It's sticking to my piece of paper. Um, so a standard little bookcase. And get a little light. Now, I uh, had uh, back to my stamp mill. I lost one of these. Uh, you know, I, I don't know what happened to it, but uh, you know, this is the the Whistley table. Um, and I I talked to Western Scale Models. Uh, I forget the guy who owns them now. Um, and he doesn't have them. He, he's looking around for the molds. I I actually just in Tinkercad took measurements off the, the, the metal piece and threw it up in Tinkercad and I printed myself a resin one. So I, I, cre I created my missing piece. Um, let's see. Oh, my, my little uh, filing cabinets. These are all resin printed. So everything here is resin printed. Um, you know, and as you can see, very fine details um, at, at a very small scale. And the filament-based printer, you you can't print something like this um, because the resolution is is just too big. Um, so, so that's examples of what you can do with resin printing. Um, you know, and like this piece here uh, with Tinkercad, it probably took me about an hour to get the base. I printed it. And then I found mistakes with it, um, spent another 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and Tinkercad fixed it up, and then I was done, and I had a, a piece. Um, so uh, it's, it's, if you've done any, any type of, of drawing on paper, uh, working with Tinkercad or any CAD system is, is not that hard. Questions? Let's see. Uh, no, nothing else in the room. And I'm a, you have my email uh, anytime you have questions or want more info on software or your, your example of how to use some of the software, I'd be more than happy to help you guys. I think that was excellent, Jonathan. Thank you. You're welcome. That was Would outstanding. A good, a good material for trucks. Um, No, I don't think a resin would be good for that. Um, resins, well, at least I'd, I'd have to look into it. The resin I'm using is too brittle once it's cured. Um, so it becomes very, um, there's no play in it. You know, any little motion in that would crack it. Um, however, there are new resins coming out. Um, and so there might be a good resin for that now, a softer or a more pliable resin. 
Hey, John, yeah. so if I've been using, you know, Shapeways to have parts printed. You know, I figured that they have a lot better printer than I can buy at home. But from looking at your presentation, it looks like the resin printers are getting pretty close to the Shapeways quality, at least for things we need for models. So, yes. Uh, so I've printed a lot from Shapeways. So that Saturn F... Uh, F1, um, the, the little, actually both of them that where I, I showed, um, I got from Shapeways. Um, and the detail level on those is outstanding, and I, I got those years and years ago. I'm getting the same resolution of that off of my printer um, that was from Shapeways um, at a fraction of the cost once you factor out the, uh, the investment of getting the machine. Now, what Shapeways offers that home printing still doesn't is the variety of material that you can actually get things in. Um, so uh, back to the question on the, um, the, the truck. Um, I, it's, I'd have to look into what resins are available nowadays that you can print with it. Um, but I know Shapeways has material that you could print the trucks from. And a recommendation for starting. Uh, what do you, you so recommend for what? Starting which? From the chat window. So I think the question probably is more along, you know, if you're just starting out, which is better, resin or FDM and, you know, et cetera. Is, yeah, okay. So that's a good question. So so the uh, filament base or the FDM is easier to start with. Um, and so that's where I started. It's very forgiving. Um, however, what you want to print from a modeling perspective, so if you want to print things for your actual layout, um, I don't think the FDM or the the, the filament-based printing would you, you could do anything with because you can't get the resolution you need. Um, if you want to do printing of parts for your your layout, um, detail parts, you know, for buildings or outside handles, whatever, um, you're going to have to go into resin. Resin is harder to learn. Um, it's, I would still consider myself a, a, a novice on the resin printing because I'm still running into, hmm, that didn't print quite right. So, so John, just a comment. I, I've actually, as part of when we get to it, I've got a couple of slides on. I bought an FDM printer because uh, they are under $200 now. And I think it's probably maybe a good way to learn because to, mm -hmm. you end up printing a lot of things. And, and, you can, and it turns out scale is actually interesting because when you get into O scale, there's more you can print. Ah, good Be because it's basically volume, so you're double in three dimensions. So, you know, a part in O scale is actually not twice as large; it's seven times in volume larger in the three dimensions. So, when you look at essentially display dimensions, you've got a lot more room. Um, so, you know, I think if you go to G scale, you might find there's a lot more you can print um, on a filament printer than you can in N. That, I mean, that's a, it, yeah, that's a very good point. I, I forgot about the scale aspect. I'm, I'm one of those weird SN3 guys, um, and so small is good. <laughs> yeah. Cool. But, yeah, it, it, it's, you know, learning in my, my initial learning how to 3D print, the ramp time on the FDM or the filament-based uh, was really fast, and when I got into resin printing, it was like starting all over again. Um, and it took me—it's been taking me longer to get good prints out of the resin printing. Cool. So, for those of you who haven't, I, if you're honest, I'm a, I've put a few pictures up of stuff that I printed. So, I bought a printer. It's only been about three or four weeks, and so let me show a few um, a few prints. Um, yeah, I'm going to throw this in. So this is the this is that moss landing module I'm building. And hang on, let me go back here. Go back one. 
So if you look here, because again, this is ON30, um, on the left where that, that dock is, those are now some 3D printed items. And then I, I'm going to show you the trusses for the roof in this building. Uh, so this is actually the dock. So I'm trying to recreate as the scene on the left, on the right. Um, the building is actually just a printed, paper printed building as a stand-in. Um, so I had to create a couple of coffin fuel tanks and then a there's a longer fuel tank you can see there. And so basically the idea was to, once I got the printer was to use it to print those pieces. Um, so this is actually a close in. What you see on the left is the, and, and literally, you know, this is after two weeks to be able to print some of this stuff. So I think Jonathan's point is on the filament, um, it's $200 and you can actually do things that start to get pretty interesting pretty quickly. So the left is, basically the coffin tanks and one of the challenges was trying to get this slam the slant on the sheet at the top the one on the left has actually had some uh some squadron um putty put on it with some acetone to thin it out to smooth out the lines because you can actually see on the one on the right those are the lines you get with the filament printer because those are actually the layers and this is actually running at 0.12 so it's at the finest resolution of the printer um, the legs, actually, as you see on the right there, were printed. Those are printed. They're unpainted at this point, but they're printed as two separate pieces that glue together and then the feet that go on. So these are actually the, the pieces there. Um, what you see on the left are the, the pieces that, a uh, little piece of PVC pipe for the, the tank. I'm going to wrap um, around where the connections are. I'm going to put banding so you won't see it. And then the little legs that I are created, and those printed actually together. What's interesting, and you can't see this very well on the right, on the lower picture, you can actually see the lines of the print head. On the upper picture, it uses a, a this is this learning curve, a thing called ironing, which actually uses the print head to smooth out the print and really smooths things out a lot. So you can actually get rid of a lot of those lines. Uh, this is another example. This actually is an acrylic framed building. I'm trying to build these very strong because they're on a module and they're actually all removable. Um, the roof is acrylic. Um, it's got a couple of little um, tabs that, go, that slide against the roofs on the end to keep it positioned. But I wanted to put trusses in it and decided it wasn't worth trying to put wood trusses in. So those are actually just 3D printed. Um, so basically the plexiglass on the roof is scribed. Um, it's, it has some texturing on it and then was painted and dry brushed. Uh, what's interesting is if you look on the line on the roof there, that's actually on the interior, it was put lines on the outside where the truss was going to be, then taped on the inside and painted it, then took the tape off and you could see where to glue the trusses. Um, so they're actually glued in in place. And then some, uh, we talked about this, some paper, um, some paper um, gussets there on the trusses. And so they're going to go in here and you'll just see a little bit of them. Uh, I ended up doing, so I decided to use FreeCAD. Um, it turns out there's a pretty good controversy going on right now around Fusion 360 because they've changed their free licensing. Um, Tinkercad is actually a free program of AutoCAD. They sell to schools or give to schools and that, so that's probably not a problem. But trying to keep those, create complex shapes, Tinkercad's great for boxes, but trying to create com complex shapes is a challenge. So this is actually kind of the process of creating in FreeCAD. Um, to create this thing, what you do is you create a series of sketches and then you grow the sketches in the third dimension. So it's kind of, if you, you look on the left, on the top is the part. If you look where it says pad, there's a sketch. That's the sketch on the bottom left, which is actually part of the truss. And then you add in the ind other individual pieces and each one is an individual little sketch and gets grown and then they're combined together and that becomes the print. So you can do, you know, a lot of really complex sizes in it. And then this is back to the same thing that um, Jonathan talked about, where you put it into the slicer. Um, this is the slicer that comes with the printer I bought, the Creality, or you can use Cura, uh, which is actually the Creality's one's based on Cura. Um, and you can put just put the parts on the print bed. And I, what you saw with Jonathan, you put a bunch of parts on there. The other thing I found was at the O-Scale Group in Pleasanton, we're building a test module for CTC signaling. And because it folds up, you can't use full-time size signals. So again, going back to Thingiverse, I found a signal on Thingiverse that had this really nice head. 
And what I wanted to use was use the, the cover, light covers there, but I couldn't have something that stuck up because when it closes, the two parts close up as a clamshell and the space for this signal is only about an inch, inch and a quarter. So what I did was design this little part here that actually holds that signal head and then holds two LEDs. Um, and so this is actually what that part looks like. And I think, John, and this comes back to the point is the cool thing about these tools, especially when you get into the CAD tools, is you can divide, design really interesting, complex shapes. And once you understand the concepts, they're pretty simple. So this shape here is actually this rectangle down here, um, which is actually on as a, as a drawing. And then this oval shape up here at the top, and you just use a real simple linking command to connect those together. And so if anybody's interested at some point, I'll show you how to do this. Once you kind of learn the concepts of this, it's really easy to design complex shapes. So uh, my printer is just out in the open. What Jonathan said, the first thing you do is you print lots of uh, pieces for it, and then you print lots of stuff that you throw away. So uh, I think it's, it's pretty interesting that you can start this. Somebody asked the question how to get started. I bought the printer. It was 189 bucks delivered, and a spool was 22 bucks. So I think for $212, you basically are starting out. And by the way, the first thing you do is you print a bunch of stuff for your printer to make it more effective. Go online and go watch some YouTube videos. So pretty exciting. Yeah. So so I wanted to share this real quick. On uh, Since uh, you're printing with uh, the filaments, this is a product that you can brush on to parts. Um, it's a resin specifically designed for 3D printing things, and I've used this. Um, and it, if, you, if you, instead of trying to sand the piece or fill it with putty or all that, you paint this resin on and you get this perfect finish that's really great for painting and, and works great. So I highly recommend that. Cool. So I'll throw it open. Anybody else have, you know, is kind of anybody else playing with this, have anything that they're interested in kind of showing and talking about? Hey, Jonathan, I do have one question for you. I'm looking at doing some 3D parts, and it's going to mimic a, a wooden framework, for lack of a better way to phrase it. Is there anything out there about, creating texture on these parts because it looks like all the parts try to come out looking like smooth metal. Ah, yeah. So <laughs> great question. Um, I, so I'm in the process of trying to um, design out a, a, a boiler uh, for my mill. And I wanted some part of it, some, some like a wooden deck around it. And actually in Tinkercad, because I'm, I'm still using Tinkercad for that particular piece, there is a wood texture. Um, and so I just included that wood texture and it automatically had like this grain pattern in the part. Um, so yes, you can absolutely do that. I, I was printing all smooth stuff because I wanted smooth stuff, but you can. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's it, you know 3D printing is it's a fascinating technology. One of the interesting things because my son's into you know the miniature gaming, um, he, he, we found this piece. Uh, it's it's if you're familiar with uh, the game Gloomhaven, you've got these counters and little pieces um, that you put on, and they had cardboard stands, and then you had to keep track of the score on this other thing. Somebody came up with a 3D printable part that. You print as one piece, and it spins and moves, and there is no way you could make a piece like that that you wouldn't have to glue or snap together. But the printer just like prints this piece that is movable with locking rings and everything in one shot. And it, it, it's a fascinating engineering effort in that. Um, and, and I looked at how I reverse engineered it. I, it's it's mind-boggling what you can do with this technology. Phil, this is Jerry Ingram. Um, I mentioned last night when we were talking at ACCRS about a project I was working on that involves 3D printing. Would you like to take a look at it? Sure, sure. That was, I, I kind I, of thought it was a great chance to have folks show what, what they've been doing I, as well. I, I apologize about being a little late to your meeting. Um, Nine o'clock is usually a little early for me, okay? <laughs> Hence, I'm in my bathrobe and coffee cup. In any event, uh, I hope you guys can see this. Uh, this is a, a project I've been working on uh, for about the last two months. 
the the actual 3D printed part is this roof. This is a uh, an effort at, at replicating a Western Pacific uh, coach, and this this is an uh, this particular set of parts right here are really uh, this is actually an Eastern Car Works P Pennsylvania P70, which was the basis for what the the WP used to make a 70 foot coach. The only problem was that the Penzi used cholesterol cholesterol roofs, and the the WP had a Harriman roof on it. So what I've done is I've created a Western Pacific Harriman roof, which you could I hopefully could see in this this image right here, and it fits on the uh, the Eastern Car Works uh, kit. And uh, our first effort was. And I'm going to turn it off to one side so you can see the, uh, hopefully you can see the, uh, the detail. And uh, this was actually printed by Shapeways. And they did a pretty, and this is what they call their FUD, F-U-D, Fine Ultra Detail, uh, which is not the most, um, not the finest detail that they make, but uh, it's the second finest, I think. And, and, and this was actually an interesting project in that the uh, roof uh, is one part and then the, the car, you buy the car kit from, you know, you get it online from eBay. There's a number of these sitting around out there. I think Eastern Car Works kits are still available. But this was a kit that was, that was produced back in, I guess, the 60s and 70s. And um, so you don't have to buy, print everything, but you can buy this for a few bucks and then you have this you can print up your roof and put it in place and put it on the car and get a get a very a very accurate representation of what the WP car uh, looked like uh, that was used in the Expo Flyer which is what this car is designed to kind of complement. Um, one of the uh, the reason I got into this is because I had a brass model of this car and it got stolen <laughs> so and I've been unable to find a replacement so I'm into into having to build one based on these particular dimensions. But it, it's been kind of an interesting project. The roof has been, uh, needs a little more work. It's not quite long enough. We, so, you know, there's shrinkage associated with 3D printing and how one goes out, goes about calculating that is kind of a dark art as near as I can figure out. So if anybody's got any ideas out there about how to calculate shrinkage associated with 3D printing, I'd appreciate knowing about it. And the other issue is one of, um, I, I like the, what uh, the, the previous gentleman mentioned is that there's a material that you can now spread on that fills in the, the less res resolution. Uh, and the fact that the uh, 3D printers, um, it, it takes care of the gaps that are formed as a result of, of um, filament type printers. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I didn't realize that was available. But anyway, I thought you might be interested in seeing this. Yeah. One of the things, by the way, I'm going to ask Jonathan to do is to grab a bunch of those links and send them to me. And I'll try to put those in the YouTube video when I post it. The links That'd to some of the, you know, there's, if you can just put all that in the text in the YouTube video, put a bunch of links in there so they're there. Uh, yeah. by, by the way, one of the things I've found when you go look at YouTube videos of the printers, and here I, I, I wanted to show you this. This was... Um, let me put up a, I'll put up a real quick share here. This is, um, so this is from Thingiverse. And that's actually a crate on Thingiverse. And if you look over here, these are actually some I got, and I did not design these, but printed that actually have that, you know, have wood grain built into them. So again, I think it's, Depending on the CAD system you have, you can add that in. And those were actually with a filament printer. Those are, you know, about, they're probably about a half inch square on the end. And actually doesn't look too bad. And on a, by the way, you know, I'm getting 99% convinced you have to buy a, a resin printer for modeling. But yeah, so I, 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 yeah. yeah, I was going to say, there, I, you're going to want both. Right. Um, I, it's, I use both printers quite a bit. Um, and they each are used for different types of things. By the way, one of the interesting things on the truss, those trusses is because they're laid up, you know, if you think about it, they're printed this way. So when you look at the edge of the truss on the bottom, it's got 
it, it actually has the layers on it and it actually almost looks like really straight wood grain. So, you know, it, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting. That side of them actually doesn't look that bad necessarily. So, so what I've been playing with is I, I have a spool of wood infused fiber um, and you can stain it because it's, got wood in it and so i've been playing around with uh, yeah how do you stain the filaments that have wood in them um uh, now unfortunately the one i got has a bamboo wood in it i'm going to go back and buy something that's uh a little more stain uh acceptable you know bamboo doesn't like to stain <laughs> hmm. that's fascinating um phil uh, with regard to the resin printers um what is the largest platen that's currently available, you know, i.e. the surface that you can use to print on, and, and do you know a manufacturer? Well, Jonathan, I'd throw it to you because I think you have the AnyCubic, and I don't know how big the platform is on it. It's yeah, it's 200 by 400 millimeters, sorry, 200 by 200 millimeters. Um, yeah, no, that can't be right, because um, that's 20 by 20 centimeters. That's not right. <laughs> Let me, um, it, so it, it's like three inches by four inches is its printing surface. Um, but uh, they've, they've now come out with a new one that has like double that size. Um, the the resin printing actually what is the limiting factor or the most cost piece of it is the um, DLP screen they use that they that blocks out the UV light um, and having one that's that's resistant to UV light that's the con the piece that's going to wear out in a 3D printer a resin printer is that DLP screen. Um, and uh, you probably get a couple of years out of it, and then you're going to have to replace the screen, at least with today's technology. But that's the limiting size. But that, but you know, like I would suspect that that technology is continuing to improve and move forward, and also a reduction in cost as well. So uh, I, I'm looking for stuff that's roughly about you know, 12 inches, rather than have you send things off to Shapeways um, or one of the other printing houses. Um, but I need at least 12 to 13 inches in length and at least maybe 12 to 13 inches in width or an appropriate, you know, uh, do you have any idea when that would be available or have you seen any products that relate to that? Yes. Yeah, the, I mean, those printers are available, but not at the hobbyist price point yet. Um, my guess is we're a couple of years away from a, a hobbyist okay. price point for that. So kind would of be my give, best guess. To, to give you an idea, the, the Photon, which is the resin printer, is 115 millimeters by 65 by 155. So it's four and a half inches by 2.5 inches by 6.1 inches high. So the build plate is 4.5 by 2.56. That's the $170 photon. Um, the, the resin, or excuse me, the filament printer um, is 220 by 220 by I think 200 and something, 240 or 250. So it's about double the size. And then today you can buy for probably about $100 more, you can buy a 400 by 400 um, filament printer. So if you kind of think about from a technology perspective that the size and that they're probably two or three years ahead, it's probably going to be a couple of years before the resin printers get up to that size at a cost point. Yeah, so so any cubic does have uh, they, they they have now a, a what do they call this the the mono printer yeah the mono printer and so it's a two hundred the the build volume is one hundred and thirty by eighty by one hundred and sixty five millimeters right so that's that's their largest one. So you get about you you get about you know somewhere close to double the print area in each dimension, which again, you know, from a, because you're, it's, you get, you can put parts eight times the volume at the same cost point today on a, on a filament printer versus resin. So resin is probably better, a lot better for smaller parts. Yes. Yes. Unless you do two pieces that you put together. Which I, I even with, 
filament printer, I've been doing that. So I, I do have an air filter on my filament printer in the, in the box, and I 3D printed that for the HEPA filter, but it was too big for the printer bed, so I just printed an A half and a B half, and they had locking tabs that, you know, I glued together and I was good there. Well, uh, very interesting stuff, to say the least, as, as technology moves forward. Um, just out of curiosity, uh, for a, a resin printer that is at uh, 12 by 12 inches in length, at least the bed length, 12 to 13 inches, what's that cost point at this, at this, at this point? Do anybody have got an idea? Well, here, here's, so here's the one that, um, I'll just show you a picture. This was the one that Jonathan was, I think, referencing. This is the new AnyCubic Larger Faster 4K. So these things, what Jonathan said is, uh, in the bottom of this, down underneath here, there's actually basically a screen, an LCD screen. Mm -hmm. And it's generating light going up, and I, there must be another layer of light. And that's how they actually get the points to congeal. Mm -hmm. So this is using a 4 I think this says it's using a 4K screen, which is what you need to get. Whereas the, as you get if you make it bigger and the screen resolution stays the same, then the resolution of the part actually gets less. So to make it bigger, they had to go to a 4K screen. So if you look at the specs on this, it, the volume is, is basically 192. So, you know, that's, what is that, about 8 inches in that dimension. And this one's 750. Mm -hmm. Pre-order 760. It's a new. So I, I, think, I think the problem in the resin, to get that large, you're going to have a, a real problem with cost. You're probably yeah. over a thousand dollars easy. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, talk in the order of like ten thousand. So, buddy of mine works up at HP Inc., which is building the the professional grade ones, the ones that like Shakeways buys. And actually, what they do is they'll take that 4K screen and just like the big screens that they have in stadiums. They're actually a bunch of little screens put together, and then they're all synchronized. That's how they make the big printers. And so now you've got a bunch of those screens, because you can't, like, print one part and move it. It's got to be entire layer at a time. And so they, they basically put a bunch of those screens together, then through some fancy controller boards, get them all synchronized so they can print those big parts. So do they need do they need a mass of of parts to print to test that we could submit to test for? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I am I, I am exploring what I can get out of that. <laughs> I mean, we could probably provide them with some unique stuff to print to test. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Yes. Well, I think that's probably kind of the the end of this. I think we'll probably go ahead and wrap this up. Um, this session of section of the session. Uh, I hope that was interesting. I, I think it's a phenomenal opportunity for modeling, um, both uh, both sides, the, the filament and the resin printers. So hopefully everybody uh, gets a little bit of experience out of it, and we'll, we'll come back and, and visit it again in another day. Yep, and if anybody has questions or thinks of things, oh, I wish I would have asked, uh, I threw my email in the, the chat. Um, feel free to reach out to me. I'll be happy if, if you've got software questions, printing questions, run into a problem. Yeah. Cool. Um, so the last thing I wanted to spend a little bit of time on today was um, ta getting any input uh, from anyone for the PCR board meeting this afternoon. Um, Bob's here. I'm here. Um, take those inputs in. Uh, the one input I've had is everybody's getting excited about the convention next year and getting signed up, so we've got that. Is, any, is there anything else that anyone would like us to bring up um, relative to the PCR, not from a coast perspective for, for later today. Yeah, Phil. Yeah. Um, we usually have our, uh, meetings when we have physical meetings on a Sunday morning. This is impossible for me. Is there any possibility of maybe afternoons or Saturdays? <laughs> So, so that was actually something I wanted to bring up because we kind of picked this time 
kind of by serendipity, it does exclude anybody in Hawaii who doesn't want to get up really early in the morning. Yeah. Um, and I kind of am cognizant of that we've kind of shafted those guys by doing this. Um, one of the thoughts was that, is there an interest in moving this to a different time? I mean, clearly we do. We have done normally our meetings on Sunday. I'm, I'm very open to doing something at, you know, one o'clock on Sunday, kind of an after church time, like we used to have, you know, our events, um, physical events, um, kind of open it up I, just kind of for commentary is anybody's last time I did this, we kind of, there was a general agreement. This was a good time for most folks. On the other hand, I know it's really an impossible time for a few folks. Yeah. And I, I'm not opposed to doing something to accommodate them. Right. So this was kind of this is kind of last time I did this and had this there was kind of the loud thud of no one saying yeah that's a great idea because I think folks kind of like this time frame so um, well I, I do like this time frame but I think we got to like you say think about the guys in Hawaii um, yeah let. So our, our next event will be in a couple of weeks. Do we want to try to do that on Sunday? Is I so a question that's interesting. If we move this to Sunday at one o'clock, kind of can anybody anybody who can't come kind of raise your hand or click on there's a there's a reaction thing at the bottom. And so like if you can't come at one o'clock on Sunday, click on the the cry icon there on reactions. You can cry. That way I can see how many folks. So we're going to lose at least a couple of folks on Sunday. How about, so is that, anybody who didn't say they can't come, is that is that a reasonable thought process? Should we try that for two weeks from now? Phil, for me, I find that there's a lot more conflicts on Saturday morning than there would be on later Saturday, maybe even Saturday evening. Saturday evening is the other option. We could do it at 7 on Saturday evening. There were a few folks back that said that was a problem, but that was that may have been fairly early on. So maybe we should try Saturday at 7 o'clock Saturday evening next time, and then we can try it once in two weeks from now, and then we can decide what we want to go back to after that. I, I'm open either way. Works for me. I, you know, the, the bad news for me is every day is Groundhog Day. <laughs> I mean, it's been it's been Groundhog Day for six months. I cannot believe the fact that we've been in this CRAP for seven and a half months, and counting, uh, and count. Well, and counting, and there's a hundred. We had hundred thirty thousand people get this stuff, and we're still in this situation. So, Bill, oh, well. I, I think the OPSIG uh, meets on Sunday at one eight. One in the afternoon, or four o'clock East Coast time. So yeah, I think you're one, right. One conflict with uh, doing it on Sunday afternoon. I don't think there are any seven p.m. Saturday conflicts because all the East Coast guys are done by then. Mm -hmm. So why don't we try that? I, I'm going to try that for two weeks from now, and and I know we had a couple of folks that said they would miss that, but let's try it two weeks and see if you can make it and. We'll see, we'll see kind of at the end of that, we'll have the same discussion just like we had now and decide whether we want to keep doing that or move back to the 9 o'clock time. I'm, I, you know, like I said, I'm, the, my goal was really to accommodate the maximum number of folks being able to come. Cool. Um, any, so that's kind of for us to decide. I think that's the decision. So when I send out the next, when, when I send out the next Coast Extra next for Thursday, Friday, I'll note that, the next time we get together, we decided to do seven o'clock in the evening. Um, any other PCR inputs? Cool. Well, then I guess with that, we'll we'll throw it. Is there any last things anyone wants to share, or we will call it a day? Interesting session, Phil. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Yo, thank. I, and by the way, Jonathan, thank you. That was superb. I mean, I. Just brilliant. I guess the only question I would ask is, do you see any reason to have separate enclosures? Or can you put them both in the same enclosure? Um, yeah, you could put them both in the same enclosure. Uh, the, the enclosure is really to manage the temperature and the smell. Right. And if you're printing, 
you only one at the top, then who cares? Right. I, I'm actually going to put them in the garage. I've decided after thinking about it that having a nice place in the garage is the best place to have it. Yeah, yeah. I it's I would recommend having the printers not in your primary modeling area. <laughs> Uh, by the way, the filament printer is not bad. I, it's actually in a room. It's in my train room, sitting on a table there, and it's not bad in that space. But but I, the resin printer, I I can understand, is really bad. Yeah, yeah. Well, and so yes, my my filament printer does not give off any odor that I can tell. But I've read enough articles on there are micro particles that come off of it, um, and it's not conclusive what that does to your lungs. Um, it's just the like when you airbrush, you should wear a mask. Um, it's a similar concept. So yes, they do not smell, but they're still trying to figure out. What comes off of those things? Well, wow. something to think about. All that COVID susceptibility, then. I, yeah, <laughs> and so so I opted to put mine in a in a box, and it has a HEPA filter on it because I figured that's a small investment. <laughs> yep. Excellent. Well, that I'll, I'll bid everybody a good week, and uh, we'll plan on two weeks from today, which is I think the twenty first at seven o'clock p.m. And we'll all be be together then. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Yep. Have a great week. Thank you, Phil. Thanks. Thank you, Thanks. Phil. Thank you, Phil. Bye. Bye now. Hey, Phil. Yeah, thank you, Phil. You still there? Thank you, Phil. <clears throat> yes, I am. Hey, yeah, great when you're printing with PLA filament, you're not going to smell anything. But if you're printing ABS, you don't want to be in the same room with it. Ah, that's a good point. I've only done PLA. I've never seen that's that's. That's a learning you haven't had, haven't done ABS. Yeah, I do a lot of ABS for the G-scale stuff that's going to be outside. Because the ABS is UV resistant where PLA isn't. Right. Yeah, yep, yep. And the, if you print with, like, the uh, the filled ones, which I've done, they give off a, a nice burnt wood smell, as they, which is pretty potent. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. So we have to ventilation, and, and the other thing I've heard with resin is that you have to have lots of gloves. You go through gloves like mad. You do go through gloves. I've read uh, that the resin burns your fingers if it gets on it. Um, I've gotten it on my hands, and I've never been burnt by it. It's sticky, and it's hard to clean. <laughs> so it's just best to wear gloves.